by the way, he plans to be here for another 25 years, just not directing the choir and the music, right? I'd like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the book of Galatians, the New Testament book of Galatians. We've come to the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 1, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1. There have been some great changes that have taken place in our nation, there's no doubt about that. And so many things are happening, it puts your head in a spin sometimes. And as you consider the changes in our country, the changes in our world, that are reflected in the movement of people and decisions people make, I hope that you understand from my vantage point the greatest changes that have been made have been made in churches. People have forsaken their moorings. And what we find in the course of human events is reflective of what we've forsaken in the work of the Lord and our adherence to the word of God. And so many times when we do have a revolution back to the Bible, our position, which we trust will be biblical, looks so different from this changing world's position that people get the idea those people are just off the wall. When in reality what we're trying to do is take a Christ-like position with biblical justification. When you have your Bible open to the book of Galatians, remember we're dealing with people who insisted on keeping the law to have salvation. So God gave us a book in the Bible to help clarify that in the book of Romans. On the other end of that spectrum, you have people who believe that there's absolutely no law, anything goes. God gave us a book in the Bible to deal with that subject, which is the book of James. If you really believe, if God has changed your life, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. And we, we prove our justification, which is a judicial term God has declared of us, meaning that we are righteous before him, not on our own merit, on the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If we've asked God to forgive our sin and by faith we've trusted him as Savior as this young man sitting before me has asked God to forgive his sin and by faith has trusted the Lord Jesus as his Savior, then God has declared he's justified. And his record, Christ took on the cross. He took all our sin and we have received all his righteousness. And so we have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ on our account. And God himself declares that we're justified. Amen. Now how does the world see that? The world sees that in the way we live. Improving a changed life by living the Christian life. When we come to the book of Galatians, we're dealing with people who said, all right, it's, it's enough that you say that we come to God by repentance and faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But once you do come to the Lord and become a Christian, then your works keep it. Not so. Not so. We are saved by grace. We live by the grace of God. Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. What we do as Christians, we do because of what Christ has done for us. We love him because he first loved us. And we give him glory for that. And we're free to live the Christian life. I hope you experience that freedom. We're right at the heart of this message in Galatians chapter 4. And Paul declares on the inspiration of the Spirit of God as he's dealing with a very serious subject, correcting this serious subject that's gone into error. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. 
And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, saying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid for you. I'm afraid of you. Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh ye despise not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when I'm present with you. Paul is encouraging them here to live what he's taught them, not only when he was with them, but while they're away. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this expression. And it captures, I believe, what, what we're trying to get across in this particular passage that I've read. In verse 15, where is then the blessedness? Where is then the blessedness? Where is the blessedness? Where is the blessedness? Now, if you go back to chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, he's explaining some things to them about Judaism, coming to Christ. The way to God has always been through faith. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. And he's giving somewhat of an illustration here that they're very familiar with about a child who may be heir of a million dollars, but as a child he cannot comprehend that. But there has to come a time of maturity in a person's life to understand what he really is and what he really has. And he says in verse 2, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. And so as a child without understanding, others are guiding his life and helping him understand these things. And notice he uses the expression, the time appointed. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God chose this particular time when everything was right. God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now the law was used of God to help us understand our need of Christ but the law could not bring us to Christ. The law was used as an instrument in God's hand to convict us of our great need of salvation. As a matter of fact, when you read and study and memorize the Ten Commandments, every commandment we have broken, whether in action or attitude. And as we read and study those commandments, we should say, with every one of them, I need Jesus to help me do this. I need Jesus to help me do this. I cannot live this life apart from God. Now God has given his spirit 
so that when we ask God to forgive our sin and by faith trust the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior, the Lord Jesus comes to live inside us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Every person in this place today that's put their faith in Christ and Christ alone for salvation has the Lord Jesus living in you. He's living in you. The Bible says, as I've read to you many times in Romans chapter 8, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He's none of his. And so I want you to write just a few things down, would you please? First, let's consider their lives, their lives. It is our life God is dealing with, and our life is to be Christ. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And our life is not about trying to keep a bunch of rules or trying to figure out everything imaginable that God has said and make sure we've crossed every T and dotted every I. Our life is allowing Christ to have his way in us. And so these people who were hindering Paul's work, they followed him everywhere he went. They were on his heels trying to disrupt what he'd done as he brought the glorious gospel of Christ to people and explained to them the way of salvation is in the person of Christ and Christ alone, then immediately these Judaizers would come on their heels trying to convince them that the way to Christ was through Judaism. No, that's not true. Well, if it's not getting to Christ through Judaism and keeping all the law, then the way to keep it is to keep all the law. And God's word says, no, that's not true either. You see, what we're dealing with here is the lives of these people. What we're dealing with is your life and my life. And I want you to look at verse 7, verses 6 and 7. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, we don't know exactly what that word Abba means, but it is the tenderest of terms and pointing us to the Father. As a matter of fact, I want you to hold your place here and turn with you back to the gospel according to Mark just for a moment. When the Lord Jesus Christ was going to Calvary to bleed and die for our sins, as he was praying, and great sweat drops of blood broke through the pores of his skin as he prayed, not my will but thine be done. Listen to the language of the Lord Jesus in Mark chapter 14, if you have your Bible open there. Our Lord is in prayer, and people paint this neat picture of Christ kneeling on a stone with his hands clasped, but it wasn't kneeling on a stone with his hands clasped. It was with blood breaking through the pores of his skin mixed with the mud and dirt of the earth as he poured out his heart to God under the burden of the cross. As he was about to bear your sins and mine on Calvary, to taste death for every man, every wicked thing you and I have ever done, or any human being has ever done. He was to pay our debt in full. And when he would pay that sin debt, tasting death for every man, the billows of God's wrath would roll on the Son of God as he became sin for us. He who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And we find him here in prayer. And the Bible says in verses 35 and 36 of Mark chapter 14, and he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, the same word, the tenderest of terms that can be used in human language in regard to God, the closeness, the most intimate term that can be used with God. There may be many people who do not know who use the word Father and repeating the model prayer that Jesus taught. But really, he is not their Father unless they're his sons. Amen. See, we're more than servants. And the idea here, we'll go back to Galatians in a moment. The idea here is that we're not just being ordered around like someone in duty. There are things we're dutifully doing. There are things God has given us to do. The Christian life has that substance to it. But we're more than servants. We're God's children. I have two wonderful sons, and I praise God for them. Six beautiful grandchildren, two lovely daughters-in-law, and my darling wife and I, we don't look at our children like they're just something to be bossed around. 
It's a family. And Paul is saying to these Galatians, God has brought you in by the blood of Christ. This isn't a, a, a rules and regulations game that God is playing with you. You're one of his children. Your life is a life as a child of God. God is your father. You're his son. We're joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ lives in you. And the same tender term that Christ used here is how we're instructed to speak to our God. I want you to stop with me in a moment at the book of Romans, would you please? And God tells us in Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, and that's a tremendous expression to meditate upon. Look at it, please, in the heart of verse 15 of Romans chapter 8. Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. In other words, God is not some dirty bully running around a club with a club in his hand trying to force you to do everything he wants you to do. You see, we, we have learned to serve the Lord because of what the Lord has done for us. We've been washed by his precious blood. Heaven is our home. Our inheritance is him. And all we have in him, we're rejoicing. And the more we learn of him and know of him, not about him, but him, the more grateful we become for all he is. And so we rest in him. It's not some fearful existence. I do something wrong, I'm going to be cast into hell. No, that's settled. The devil has no control in this matter. He's been defeated. He's a defeated foe. We belong to the Lord. We're his children. And he says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You see, someone came in on the lives of these Galatians, turned them aside, made fearful beings out of them, disrupted what Paul had preached and taught. Now they're living in fear. They're trying to live up to a set of standards and rules, trying to keep all the law, every letter of it, to retain what they found in grace. Paul says that's all wrong. God has saved you. And the same God who saved you is keeping you saved. It's all about him. This is the life we have. Not life as a servant. Yes, we serve the Lord, but we serve as a son. We're not just servants, but we serve as a son. My children do things for me, not because of duty, but because they love their father. I do things for my wife, not because she's my wife, but because I adore her. I love her. She's given herself, and I love her. And you and I have this wonderful relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, not to try to keep God happy with us all the time, but because we're already happy with him, and we love him, and serve him because we love him. As a pastor of this church for all these years, if I could bring you into that understanding, then we'll understand why. Why do we do what we do? Why do we choose the high road? Why do we try to live the way we live? Not to please some man, but to please our God who gave himself for us. And people who stand on the outside don't understand that. They think we're all trying to get there. Listen, brother, I'm already there. Amen. I'm seated with him in heavenly places, according to the book of Ephesians. I'm already there with him. Amen. But on my way to that door I go through to be with him forever, to see him face to face, I love him and want to serve him and 
keep myself right with him so I can pray and talk with him and enjoy this journey as much as I know I'm going to enjoy the destination. I want you to go back with me to the book of Galatians, our lives. Then I want you to think with me, please, about a second thing, and that is not only their lives, but their love. The Bible says in verse 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. That's the life we have now, as sons of God. But their love, how be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. And notice the little words, pronouns he's using here, ye, ye. And one of the keys in this little book of the Bible is understanding when Paul is writing of Jews and then writing of Gentiles, and he's dealing with Gentiles when he uses the word ye, referring to them, Gentiles who have come to Christ without becoming Jews before they came to Christ. Howbeit then when ye, ye Gentiles, knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. In other words, they were only gods in your mind. They weren't really gods. And we make these gods in our mind. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, and that's a beautiful thing. We say we know him, but God knows us. He knows who his children are. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you, de you desire again to be in bondage? He said, I can't believe this. God saved you out of that, and now you're going back to that. What does this world owe you, Christian? Why would you go back into that bondage, that fearful living? Why? That's what he's declaring to these people. And he gives some examples. He says, you observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you. In other words, I'm, I'm fearful what's happening to you. Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain as is all the work I have done been done for naught? Then he comes to these tender statements. Brethren, I love the way God prefaces these things. Brethren, believers, fellow heirs with Christ, children of God, members of the same family. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Notice both sides of that. He wasn't saying them just this way. You be like me. When you look at me, be like me. He said, now, let me look at you. I am just like you are. I am no greater in God's family than you are. We earn no merit. All the merit belongs to Jesus. Amen. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. If someone tries to rule over you and dominate your life and interfere with your individual soul liberty or approach you in some dictatorial way under the guise of Christianity and, and insist that they can tell you what you ought to do, I want you to know that is not of God. Amen. Because God did not create us that way. He did not redeem us and then appoint someone else to be our Lord. Be as I am. What a tremendous statement he gives us here. For I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. There's more faith in that expression at the conclusion of verse 12 than I have time, days, weeks to deal with. He says, ye have not injured me at all. What do you mean? They're snapping at his heels. They're trying to disrupt his work. I want those of us who have some level of leadership, obeying the Lord, getting something done, I want us to pay close attention to that. I want, I want you men to help me with this. He says, listen to the words again. Ye have not injured me at all. In other words, God will work all this out. 
If we didn't have anything else but just the fact that God gave him this letter to pen to correct this problem, then that's one good thing that came out of this problem. How many times have you and I realized that God allowed something in our lives that first appeared like it was going to be the most horrible thing imaginable, but God used it to bring about one of the greatest things imaginable in our lives. That's just the way the Lord works. That's the way God does his work. He is personally involved in our lives. They say the sun is 93 million miles away and some people get the idea God's 93 million miles away. No, he's nearer than your hands and feet and closer than your breathing. He's personally involved in our lives. I remember one day on an elevator, I was carrying a piece of luggage. I'd gotten out of the car, checked one of these hotels and was carrying the uh, suitcase on the elevator. Can you imagine? And a couple of the people in the elevator just stared at me. Now I've had this happen and you've heard about other people doing this. Just stared at me. And finally, I realized what I was doing. I could let the stinking elevator carry the luggage. You know? Set it down. And you know what you and I do? We carry so many things around and around and around and around so long in our lives that we can give to God and know God is going to take care of it. He's going to take care of it. Put it in His hands. Believe Him. Notice what they say about Paul. I'm talking about their love. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh. These people saw it firsthand. This gives me the idea that it was something to do with his eyesight. There may have been many other things, but it gives me the idea it was something to do with his eyesight. And they loved this man so much. Listen carefully. They loved him so much. He writes, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, you know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel to you at the first? And my temptation which was in my flesh, ye not despise not, nor reject it. But receive me as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ. You treated me like God's angel, even like the Lord Jesus. What love. He goes on. Then where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Paul said, you loved me so much for bringing the gospel to you. You cared so much for what I had done for you and recognized so readily God sent me to you. You saw my need and you would have taken out your own eyes, taken them out and been blind just to give me your sight. And I want to just stop and say, Can you remember your first love in the Lord's work and the excitement? Can you remember how thrilled you were that God had saved you and you'd gotten in with God's people? Can you remember what joy there was? Maybe even the first time you walked into a meeting in a fellowship like this, Can you remember how thrilling it was? Paul says, do you remember those days when you loved me so much? You have taken out your eyes and given them to me. You and I need to be reminded of the third thing, and that is their loss. He said, where is it now? Where is the blessedness now? Where is it now? I want to ask you a question. Do you even think it's possible to recover your first love? Do you even think it's possible to be thrilled again with the Lord and with the Lord's people? 
Do you even believe it's possible? I want to say to you that I do. I truly do. And if you think you have trouble with it, what do you think about me? Now, there may be people in the, in the fellowship of God's people at a local assembly that think they know more about people than the pastor, but the pastor, just because of the nature of the whole thing, probably knows more about the people than any person in the fellowship. And there's an open secret here for us. And that is, people can take the joy from you if you let them. But you have to let them. But only Jesus can use those same people through his marvelous work in their lives to restore it, to restore it to be a blessing and help. We grow older. We encounter lots of things. But God does not intend for our Christian life to be one of constantly losing our love for him and his work. And finally, when we're finally worn down and worn out, sort of trip and stumble into heaven. It's God's desire that we just keep choosing Christ all along the way, choosing the Lord's way all along the way, and choosing the Lord's way all along the way, and go right into glory full speed ahead. Look, when I started out, 18 years old as a preacher. First church I pastored, Greenback, Tennessee. Then I went to Lenore City, Tennessee, and then to Chattanooga. To Patterson, New Jersey, 11 miles from New York City. We had a great time. I came here 25 years ago to put my whole life in this. And I want you to know, God has kept his end of it. What a savior. But I am shocked not just upset, I'm shocked at what people are willing to do today in the name of God. Shocked. Now hold on. But my issue is, am I going to get so upset with them? In other places, what's going on in the name of God? That I'm going to lose the joy and blessing of what God desires to do in my own life. That certainly doesn't mean that I've got it all right because I know better than that and you do too. But he, he means for us not to lose his blessing and the blessedness of the Christian life encumbered with everybody else's trouble in this world. What we have in Christ, if we allow Christ to do it, is greater than anything else and will overcome any difficulty we have in any other area of our lives. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Paul said, what has happened to your blessedness? Look what you've lost. And they thought they gained. He said, look what you've lost. And I know people who feel sorry for me. They say, you're a dinosaur. <laughs> they feel sorry for me. These people here, they said to Paul, you, you, you didn't get it just right, Paul. Well, you know, the only one who gets it just right, exactly right, is God but let's just follow him and believe him and trust him. You weigh everything by the word, not by personalities. You weigh everything by God's spirit working through his word, not what everybody else is doing. What is thus saith the Lord? Where is the blessedness? And if we'd be honest with one another, Many of us would come before God and fall on our faces and say, Lord, I've lost something. The love and excitement, the blessedness, what I'd hoped would be, how it would turn out. 
Well, it's not too late to get in on what God's doing and allow God to use your life if we'll make the Lord preeminent in our lives. Preeminent, the one and only. Let me read it. Look at it, please. Galatians chapter 4. Where is then the, the blessedness you speak of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And you and I as Christians ought to say, I thank God for anyone who will tell me the truth and help me follow the Lord. You see, in this old wicked world, this world runs on one thing, their desire. It's desire, what it wants, what the people of the world, what unbelievers want, that's the way it's got to be. And the battle that's going on in our lives and in even our churches is that we must die to self and say, Lord, thy will be done. Thy will be done. And we ought to thank God for the truth. We can all be more loving, kinder, more obedient to the Lord. Every one of us has room for improvement there. But I wonder how many people out beating the drum a different way than the Bible way, if they just admit it, would say, in my heart, I've lost something I once had. Just as Paul said, where is the blessedness? There's one thing I want in my life. You mark it. I want God's blessing and his honor. I don't deserve it. No one does. It all belongs to Jesus Christ. But I believe the more we yield to him and honor him and seek to do his will, the more it gives opportunity to God for his blessing. And by the way, we won't read his blessing like the world reads it in big things, plenty of this and plenty of that. But with things they can't see, wisdom, peace of heart and mind, calmness in the storm, faith to trust him. And you and I just need to be honest enough with God to say, what is it we're looking for? I want that blessedness. Let's bow in prayer, may we?